Hello, everyone, and welcome to the University of Iowa Virtual Visiting Artist Interview Series. I'm here today with Guy Marshall Brown, who is an artist from London, UK, currently working in Stockholm. He is a graduate of the Royal College of Art London in 2018 and has a wealth of exciting exhibitions to his credit. Uh, Guy, thanks so much for being with us today. My pleasure. We uh, want to check and just sort of uh, get started with a, a first question about how you got involved in ceramics. Yeah. Um, so I guess my kind of experience with ceramics started when I started my bachelor's degree. Uh, I started my bachelor's degree at the London Metropolitan University, which is the Cass School of Art, uh -huh. um, as, as, as you said, in London. I'm originally from Gloucestershire, which is the west of England, uh, on the border between England and Wales, um, but moved to the big city to pursue a career in the arts. And when we started there, I'd, um, we had to pick kind of introductory modules, and I'd never dabbled in sculpture before, so there was this opportunity to do that. And that's what I picked. Um, we had two great, really amazing kind of tutors. And one was a sculpture tutor called Peter Fillingham. He's a, again, a British artist. And we had a ceramics tutor called Fred Gatley, who is now a very good friend of mine, an incredible ceramicist. And um, it was through their kind of introduction to sculpture, both of them really prioritized kind of traditional sculpture techniques. And so while I was doing a contemporary fine art degree, um, and there was a lot of scope for kind of conceptual works and very postmodernist works. There was a kind of, they wanted everybody to have an underlying knowledge of materials and making. So we did silicon molds, we did plaster molds, we did bronze casting, you know, we all went on a trip to a foundry and yeah, and we, and we got an introduction to ceramics, um, through the teaching of Fred Gatley. And, and that was kind of where I found my most, uh, interest. And especially when we started learning kind of uh, theoretical stuff as well. I, I read about Rodin and his love of clay and how he's saying, that, um, you know, it, it, sculpting with clay was the, the work of the gods. And I kind of looked into the, the kind of um, mythical qualities of clay, the cultural narratives that are prevalent around the world of how humans are formed from the earth and things like that. And it, yeah, it really resonated with me. And so that's how I kind of stuck with it, really. Was that a, a common uh, sort of thing to do amongst your peers or, or were you unique in that regard? Absolutely unique. It right. was, I think I was maybe like, I was, I was the only person from my entire year's cohort that spent the rest of the three years in the ceramics department. Um, there were people who had their final output as ceramic models, but that was, um, that was stuff that normally came right at the very end of the three years. Um, I actually received a commendation for the university upon graduating when he presented me with a check, which was nice, and a nicely written letter to say thank you for reinvigorating the ceramics department, mm -hmm. which was really amazing. Um, because, because I was there every day, I, you know, as soon as it opened, I'd be there with Fred and he'd be teaching me everything that he knew. And there was, there was quite a, at the university, there's quite an open workshop policy where students from all different departments can come and work. Yeah. Um, so, so it wasn't there wasn't a ceramics program, but there were uh, architect students in there making bricks and tiles for architectural models. There were design students in there making, you know, pots and tableware, functional tableware for um, for their designs. And and then me just kind of learning everything I could. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was, it was really quite um, quite exciting. But it, it was just me, I think. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Do you feel like, I mean, I wonder, you know, being familiar with your work some, um, it seems like the work that uh, you were doing when I first came to know of you uh, was, it wasn't functional, but it was sort of rooted in the vessel tradition, I would say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I wonder if that, uh, and now it seems more sculptural uh, or less vessel um, kind of based. Do you think that that early experience around the artists you were with uh, influenced that trajectory for you? Yeah, I think so. And I think it was also a, a kind of byproduct of um, doing a, building a ceramic practice while not doing a ceramics degree. Because yeah. in my second or third year, well, my second year, I kind of took a, a sculpture module again, but it was sculpture in the expanded field. And in the third year, I took uh, painting in the expanded field. 
So I would stand in crits with a group of painting students who are painting, you know, canvas on wall. Yes. And then I would present a ceramic object and be like, this is just as much painting as, as yours is. Um, and that I kind of felt like I had to root my practice in the tradition and the history of ceramics as a way of justifying why I was using ceramics. Yes. But, but equally, it was an opportunity to reject um, to reject the functionality of it. You know, I was kind of making vessels that had big ruptures in the side and deliberately couldn't be functional. And yeah. so it was a kind of way of turning around, and the tutors turned around and said, well, isn't this a craft object? Isn't this, a, you know, how is this painting? How is this an art piece? And I would say, they would say, well, it's functional, you know, and I say, it's not, it's got, it's got a real great big hole in the side of it. I'd like to see you use it for any function. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it, and it was, yeah, I, a lot of what I was writing about at the time in my kind of academic essays was about the art craft debate and what, you know, kind of lies between the two. Um, and then I once saw a talk that Glenn Adamson did yes. at um, West Dean College in the UK. He came and took part in a, um, in a kind of panel discussion. And he said, uh, he said something that really stuck with me. He said, the art craft debate is like Christmas, which is when you first hear of it, and you're young, you uh, you think it's the best thing you've ever heard of, and then the more you experience it, the more boring it gets. <laughs> and I kind of felt that um, as time went on, I was like, ah, oh, this having this discussion about what an object, what an art object is, and and kind of the functionality of it is getting boring. So yeah. I, I think I eventually felt the confidence enough to just not have to justify my practice with that. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that experience uh, of yours because I think that dialogue happens here in the United States also in graduate programs. Mm. Like you, I don't, I don't know that you can avoid it. Uh, and, and it's, I, I guess I didn't know if that was a uniquely American phenomena or if that was a ceramic phenomena or an international, you know, so he, that's mm -hmm. very similar. I know I said I was going to not talk about myself. And it's <laughs> very similar to my experience as well of making ceramics in graduate school, uh, who was to be um, involved with painters because mm -hmm. I was interested in the dialogue of mark making sort of absent from the the historical kind of blinders in a way of yeah. uh, the ceramics world, but still uniquely interested in caring about the, the tradition of the material. Um, and I found that the best way to do that, kind of like what you said, was to present the objects I was making within another context. This of course was some time ago, and now I feel like our field is very, um, it has progressed rapidly in the past, say 15 years mm. to where, you know, I think the way to be the most successful painter you can right now is to being to be doing ceramics, and uh, mm. you know, perhaps the way to be a great ceramic artist is to be thinking about painting. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I think that's okay. again. I think that is something like you're saying um, on my master's program at the Royal College. It wasn't so much spoken about. I mean, there's a diverse range of students up on that program. People come with design backgrounds and come out of it with finished set of design products and, and other people um, come into it with, you know, come illustration backgrounds and come out with a series of illustrative ceramic objects that, you know, really question what the material capabilities of clay are. Um, and I don't think I ever really had a conversation about any, with anybody about the vessel as a, as a thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are lots of guest lectures who talked about it but I personally didn't have that. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's because it's kind of fading out of need within the ceramics industry, or if it's just because that school didn't care so much, yeah. you know, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to think about those uh, sort of uh, dynamics between different areas of the world. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your current uh, making process. Yeah, sure. So my so my current practice, um, as you're saying, is is objects that are not explicitly uh, vessel like, and and actually what I kind of tend to think about is architectural fragments at the moment. That's what I'm kind of interested in. Um, that came about really throughout through my master's program. I was reading um, Joseph Reich Joseph Reichwert's uh, book called The Dancing Column, and it's about the relationship between 
the human form and architecture and how architectural designs over history have taken you know kind of prominence from the human form in 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 their designs yeah um and in particular the the, the column so the way that kind of fluted columns were originally designed obviously you've got carotid columns which are the actual physical human form sculpted into stone but just like simple ionic and doric columns where you have fluting that is supposed to mimic clothing or a smooth column would mimic the nude form and the kind of capital at the top of the curls would mimic hair and female form and things like that i was just kind of interested in that relationship yeah. um so, so i started making objects that looked a little bit like they were take like sections of column uh -huh. uh, 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 yeah like cross sections and slices as and i was kind of thinking about the metaphor of the self within these objects um yeah. are you hand it, them or are you uh making them cast from molds or so, so they're press molded so my work is press molded mainly yeah. um i have a, a kind of quite technical production of the press mold so i will hold my hands up and say i'm not a great plaster worker at mm -hmm. all um but i I'm, I've always been interested in technology. You know, I did my foundation degree. I was doing a lot of um, projection work and camera work, uh, video stuff and installation, light-based design. And it was only, as I said, I found clay when I did my bachelor's degree. So after that, um, yeah, yeah. but my interest in technology has always been there. I always like playing around with computer software and things. So I bought a really cheap 3D printer, uh -huh. uh, like PLA, not clay 3D printing, but PLA yes, printing. Yes. And I started to experiment with not making um, not making objects, not making like positive objects with PLA, but printing the negative of uh -huh. an object, uh -huh. so that I could then pour plaster into the positive space. Yes, and then make plaster molds from those objects. And you know kind of back yeah. to sports back to sports yeah, yeah. but what would have, i eventually would end up with in most commonly is um a repeated form so i try and design on rhino or kind of autodesk um if i was trying to make a complete ring for a, a press mold of a column yeah. then i would split that up into you know sections and oh. each section would have a kind of male part and a female corresponding part and they would all into once i've just repeated this plaster pouring process over and over again i'd knock out like 12 of them they would all link together and i could put a big ratchet strap on them and make this big loop that would lock together and make one big press mold did you find that that was um visually like i mean i, I having done some of this type of process myself i, I can imagine that the beginning of this idea might be because the printer bed is too small to, yeah. to make the whole <laughs> column right so yeah. um, but also i i wonder about the type of like um uh sort of mark making that would happen as you combine those things together becoming sort of an interesting artifact of the of the process yeah exactly you get these seam lines you know that i deliberately leave you get the you even print like the plaster picks up the striations of the 3d printer right. you know? yeah uh, and that kind of detail was so delicate yeah and and i deliberately kept that because i thought it led on firstly it did something incredible which was introduced you know i'm making these objects that kind of look like architectural ruins and yet uh -huh. you, you look at them on a close basis and you think there's nothing old about this you know it's in it's completely new it's digital it's yeah. and they're you know mathematically absolutely accurate because the computer's done it not my hand right which i thought was really powerful anyway um yeah. but then that the my conceptual work my conceptual idea behind my practice seemed to feed into it as well and the kind of visual language that was building up was was really quite strong for me i thought yeah. um and so like as i was developing these press molds and, and pressing these architectural forms i started thinking about what this notion of architecture as a metaphor for the self meant yeah. um and i also started thinking about architecture as a, as a metaphor for human society on the whole you know, there was there was the fire um, of Notre Dame Cathedral, and um, you know a couple of years back we had a fire in the UK uh, a tower, Grenfell Tower, where lots of people tragically lost their lives. Yes, yes, I know that story. Um, yeah, and and I was thinking about like architecture is a uh, one of 
humanity's great achievements, right? It's, it's up there with uh, maths and poetry and science and, you know, all of these things that, that humanity prides itself upon, but yet it, it actually physically dominates us every single day. It towers over us in a way that the others do not. Mm. And, and I thought, well, is, does that mean that architecture is humanity's greatest achievement? Just because it's, it's prevalent, you know, it's there every day. Yeah. Um, and so if I'm making these architectural seg segments and they are metaphors for the self and humanity in a wider picture, what is then asked when I start to challenge the physical properties of those objects? Yeah. So if I start to add inclusions to the clay that allow it to fragment or break or explode in the kiln, or if I add lower firing clays into it that allow that melt and or kind of flux the clay deliberately that, in, that introduces bloating or kind of warping of the body so i've then got these you know going back to these perfectly mathematical designed press molded objects with you know f absolutely accurate fluting of columns on them and things like that and then i fire it and it comes out all bloated and warped you know yeah. it's kind of questioning uh questioning the metaphor that I'm that I'm setting and it, it seemed quite poignant in this time where um, there are forces that are growing and there are old institutions that are decaying all around the world you know you've kind of got a rise of kind of right hand right alt right politics and you've got a, a strength in left and liberal politics with things like uh, the women's march and you know kind of marches against Trump and you know, without pointing my own political compass in either direction, it's just a kind of commentary of like, these objects are representative of the fact that the world is changing and, yeah. and the world is a different place. Um, so yeah, I was doing that a lot with, yeah, as I said, fluxing clay. I would also fire um, glazes, uh, pre-fire them. And then once they're as a solid glass form, smash them up and wedge them back into clay bodies or dig out raw clays. So kind of really playing with the the material properties of clay itself still and really kind of getting stuck into some technical stuff but while thinking of the conceptual at the same time yeah that's all i think really um, sort of a beautiful marriage of like the ideas about your process combined with the conceptual ramifications of it i mean to me what you're talking about is ultimately really reminiscent of the human condition right like we have these ideas that we are um sort of invincible, but yet, uh, and yeah. we make these structures to signify that, right? This is what empires do. They build uh, architecture to signify their strength. And, uh, yeah, exactly. and within that though, are all of our kind of human imperfections. And it yeah. seems like you're, you're building that into the work in a way. Uh, and then you watch these great architectural feats burn down in front of our very eyes and the yeah. whole world stops for a second and goes, oh, we didn't think that could happen. Yeah, right, right, right. Oh, that's, yeah, it's really fascinating. Um, well, uh, yeah, one of the other uh, things that I've asked is for you to talk about uh, an artist that you um, wanted to show us today. Um, yeah. Uh, we, might, we might do that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Great. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to uh, talk about the work of, he's a friend of mine and he's a great glassmaker. His name's Joshua Curley. He's a Curley glass... Belgium. It's with a K, right? K E R. It's about with a K. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he also is a graduate from the Royal College of Art too. He currently he used to be a technician at um, a university in the UK called Falmouth University, mm -hmm. and now he's a glass tutor at Farnham, which is part of University of Creative Arts in the UK as well. Yeah. He um, his work he produces both. Uh, quasi-functional objects, you know, um, and I think the object I've picked, I've, I've got one of these, um, is a lidded jar. Now you kind of question whether this is a functional thing or if it just alludes to the function of it's a lidded jar, but he also kind of ventures off into the other spectrum of um, installation-based stuff. He's recently been doing a bit of work with neon lighting, but he also does things, objects hanging from the ceiling, um, things protruding from a wall, and again, he kind of works in a way uh, of, he's kind of inspired by architecture as well. Right. Um, so a lot of his work, he tries to emulate the textures of architecture. So textures of brick, textures of concrete, or even kind of 
um, forms of pipe work, really industrial, you know, like brackets and clamping uh, things to a wall and things like that. Um, his work, the lidded jar that you see here, is uh, is a pat de verre um, jar. So uh, for those that don't know, pat de verre is using crushed glass. Um, it's a, I think it's, I don't know a huge amount about glass, but it's a, it's a, quite an old technique of um, packing crushed glass inside of a mold. And then you fire that crushed glass to a very low temperature, just so the granules of glass just tack together. And so that, you know, that jar structure is actually quite delicate. It's quite, you know, it's very sugar like it looks quite, um, looks like if you, well, if you did squeeze it too hard, I'm sure it would break quite easily. Yeah. Um, and then the lid is uh, a foamed glass. So he introduces, uh, I'm not too, quite sure what he introduces to a glass powder, but then when he fires that again in a kiln, it all melts and this um, glass inclusion expands, creates air bubbles and the glass kind of foams up. I've seen it when he opens the glass at top temperature just to try and catch it at that souffle peak, you know, before yeah, yeah, yeah. it collapses <laughs> down again. Um, yeah, and, and so the two lock together quite nicely. I, I think I picked that out just because it's, okay, it's, it's glass, it's not a ceramic object, but um, it's that use of material as something that is not, you know, I, I've kind of been, been interested in my own work, as I said, about putting glaze within a body as opposed to on, upon a glaze, uh, upon a clay body. Yeah. And so how can glass be used that isn't just a traditional uh, blown vessel or how can it be used isn't just kiln glass in these kind of monolithic solid color glass objects that you see in the same range of colors you know by doing this he's allowed to he's a, he's enabling himself to manipulate color he's built up a wide range of colors through different combinations of glass powders um, and obviously when they are puffed up in that inflated way they change color again, you know, is it kind of exploration of the material itself while also producing technically brilliant work, you know, he's, he's incredibly skilled. Yeah. So. Well, and it seems to share some conceptual themes with your work as well. I mean, I always find it interesting that the objects we're drawn to, you know, there, I have a, a, a number of different types of work in, in my house and in the collection that I have too. And yeah. Um, I'm not sure that it would make sense to anyone else, you know, uh, but for mm. me, there are kind of like points of um, interest across all of those objects that are sensible and like uh, match my own interests. And it sounds like this is maybe uh, a similar thing for you. Yeah, exactly. Trying to achieve something technical that is out, slightly outside of the box, um, but while doing it, you know, around these, yeah, kind of, kind of interests of domesticity, yeah. and industrial you know industrial forms and it's yeah I, I see that i see his work within my own too <laughs> yeah yeah very cool well guy uh how can people uh most easily see your work uh on, online these days? sure uh so uh quick google search my name i think my website should be the top result is uh guy marshall brown uk um or if you just put my full name into Instagram as well, you can see things on there. Yeah, everybody's more than welcome to send me a message if they've got any more questions. Very good. Um, yeah, I think that's the best two ways. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I really appreciate your time, and uh, it's exciting to hear about your process and your work. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on here. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Guy. Thanks. Bye.